Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining this webinar. We're fortunate to have five staff members from the Farm Service Agency presenting this afternoon on the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. And we really appreciate their uh, willingness to share their time and their expertise with us and to answer some of your questions. Um, I'm John Bovet, I'm with Virginia Tech. Um, I'm a, an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics. And this webinar is hosted by Virginia Cooperative Extension and Farm Service Agency. And we are going to be recording it and posting it to the web uh, when we can, hopefully pretty soon. Um, and uh, so we're gonna have, as I said, five speakers from FSA. They have a series of slides to go through. And in about 45 minutes, 50 minutes, we're going to turn it over for Q&A. So again, I really appreciate um, the speakers who have agreed to, to be here this afternoon. And we're gonna get started with Brent Whitlock. Thank you, John. I just want to sound check, can you hear me? Yes. All right, very good. Good afternoon and uh, thank you, John, for this opportunity. Uh, we do appreciate uh, the time to meet with the extension agents and anyone else that may be joining us. Uh, we hope uh, that you all are well and enjoying today. And again, thank you for joining us to have the understanding of the CFAP program. And the CFAP, we'll be using that throughout our whole presentation. That's the uh, Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Um, just want to give you a quick little rundown of our presenters. Um, my name is Brent Whitlock. I'm the Farm Program Chief for the FSA State Office here in Virginia. Our next uh, presenter will be Ashley Dalton. She'll be talking on the non-specialty and dairy uh, crops, and she is a program specialist. And then Allison Gowen will be our next speaker, and she'll be talking about the specialty crops and livestock. Um, and also, she'll be talking about uh, the uh, national, uh, excuse me, the um, notice of funding availability and additional commodities that can be added to that process, which closed the other day. Then we have Emily Horsley. She's a program specialist, and she'll be talking about the forms and documents, uh, farm numbers and new customers, and also some call center information and flow charts and some guidance uh, for our producers. And then Dan Mertz will follow up with the importance of, farm, of maintaining our farm records uh, here with FSA. And then at the end, um, I'll close it and open it up for questions. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and begin the presentation. Not moving forward. So I'm not being able to move forward on my, my key here. Still not moving. You have control, Brent. It's not. I'm not moving anywhere. Hey, I'll just, I'll move it forward for everybody. All right, thank you. All right, today's discussion, we're gonna talk about CFAP, and we're gonna talk about eligibility, payments, forms, documents, how producers uh, apply, and also how we're supporting new customers through our program. So Allison, if you can move on to our next screen, please. Our goal uh, for today is to um, cover the basics of the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic impacted producer operations in many ways. This program works to address two challenges from the coronavirus, price declines, and supply chain disruption. The pandemic caused a decline in the demand for some commodities and affected the market supply chain for many others. Some producers may have had challenges in getting products to the market before they spoiled, had to dump milk from contracts getting canceled or even affected by schools and restaurants closing. The program provides relief through direct payments to partially offset losses experienced by producers. FSA is working very quickly to provide the assistance to producers in filling out these applications and working to process them as quickly as possible for payment. 
To ensure funds uh, serve as many producers as possible, producers who applications are approved will receive 8% of their maximum total payment now up to the payment limitation, and then any additional payment will be determined by the secretary announced at a later date. And currently, we've taken uh, 5,847 applications and paid out over um, $50 million. Not too bad for a couple of weeks of work. To share some of the general program information before we go into the details, FSA is accepting applications uh, for CFAP from May 26th through August 28th of 2020. Applications are being processed on a rolling basis, which means that FSA will consider each application for approval as it comes in. And if an application is approved, FSA will process the payment, even if it's before the end of the sign-up deadline. Because FSA is working to ensure producers receive relief as soon as possible, FSA will not require documentation for the losses they report on their CFAP application. Producers will self-certify that information is accurate. However, producers should endeavor to collect any documentation they have as documentation will be required if FSA performs a spot check or certain commodities, the local committee can request to see that documentation. Once an application has been submitted, any outstanding forms or issues regarding eligibility for the applicants will need to be resolved within 60 days from the producer signing the application. Producers who have interest in an operation should apply individually. For an example, if a producer or, uh, or operating within a cooperative structure, producers should apply individually to the program. While an application can be submitted to FSA in the FSA office, a producer's office of record will process the application. FSA has identified commodities um, that are eligible for CFAP and the payments by identifying commodities that, are, that have experienced a 5% or greater um, national price loss as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic or other commodities that have substantially marketing costs of inventory. FSA sought to identify all the available price data, including prices collected by USDA and commodity trade and on futures markets. The 5% decline in future prices for these identified commodities occurred between the weeks of January 13th through 17th of 2020 and April 6th through 9th of 2020. The covered commodities include dairy, livestock, non-specialty crops, wool, and specialty crops. And we'll go, each of my program specialists will go into detail for each one of those. Uh, the non-specialty crops eligible for CFAP payments are molting barley, canola, corn, upland cotton, millet, oats, sorghum, soybeans, sunflowers, durum wheat, and hard red winter wheat. Payments will also be available for specialty crops, including but not limited to almonds, beans, broccoli, sweet corn, lemons, iceberg lettuce, spinach, squash, strawberries, and tomatoes, dairy, uh, cattle, lambs, and yearlings, wool, hogs, and pigs are all eligible. One thing we need to remember that processing entities are not eligible. A contract grower who does not own the livestock will be considered a producer um, if the contract allows the grower to have risk in the livestock. Livestock owners and contract growers who are at risk and have a share of livestock available for marketing or would have a share had the livestock been marketed are eligible livestock producers. Producers in the midst of filing for bankruptcy or closing operations, but are, were still operating within the mid-January through mid-May, may still apply. Uh, FYI, prices are collected by USDA and the commodities traded by on the future markets. Uh, participation in SBA Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program does not impact the producer eligibility for CFAT or any other USDA farm program. The PPP duplicate provision does not have an impact on the farm, on the FSA farm programs or farm loan programs. This program is designed to offset payment losses and financial impacts of the pandemic. The funds do not have to be paid back, nor are there stipulations on how they must be spent. Most producers uh, apply, have incurred significant losses to get the product ready for market 
and then could, sell, could not sell or experience a price decline. The payments are not expected to make producers whole or compensate them for their losses, but is designed to give producers some financial relief. If a producer has an outstanding debt with USDA, they will still apply, can still apply for the program if they are eligible and their payments will not be withheld to satisfy the debt. Now we're going to talk about non-specialty crops and I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Dalton. Ashley? Thank you, Brent. Good afternoon, everyone. As Brent said, I'm Ashley Dalton and I cover the non-specialty crops as well as dairy. So we're gonna start with the non-specialty. The non-specialty crops that are eligible for CFAP payments include malting barley, canola, corn, upland cotton, millet, oats, soybeans, soy grum, sunflowers, Durham wheat and hard red spring wheat. I know we have a lot of hard red winter wheat grown in Virginia, but that is not eligible. Only hard red spring wheat is eligible for the program. Wool is eligible. Any crop that is intended for grazing is not eligible. So any of the crops listed above. Producers will be paid based on their inventory held that was subject to price risk as of January 15th, 2020. Producers will be paid based on the inventory subject to price risk held as of January 15th, 2020. So anything that is unpriced. A single payment will be made based on 50% of a producer's 2019 total production or the unpriced 2019 inventory as of January 15, 2020, which er, whichever is smaller. We don't want to exceed the 50% of the 2019 total production for that particular commodity that falls under the CFAT program. You take that number, whichever is smaller, multiplied by 50%, and then multiply that by that commodity's applicable payment rate. So what do producers need to provide? The producers need to provide the following information. The total 2019 production, the total production for that commodity that suffered a 5% or greater price decline, as well as the 2019 total production that was not sold as of January 15th, 2020. And we're gonna use those figures to compare to get the smaller, the smaller of the two. So we do need that. We do not need any backup information. We just need producer certification of the two figures. So now moving on to dairy. So for dairy, CFAP payments are eligible to all dairy operations with milk production that was commercially marketed in January, February, and or March, 2020. Further, any dumped milk production during those months of January, February, and March is eligible for assistance. For dairy, a single payment will be made based on the producer certification of milk for the first quarter of the calendar year 2020 multiplied by $4.71 per hundredweight. The second part of the payment is based on the national adjustment to each producer's production in the first quarter multiplied by $1.47 per 100 weight. And the last thing I want to say on dairy is that dissolved dairies, so dairies that went out of business during that time frame would be eligible. So say they went out of business in March, they're eligible for the, the, the months that they produce their milk. So please let everyone know that the, those dairies are eligible even if they dissolve during that first quarter time frame for this program. So now we'll be moving on to Allison for specialty crop. 
All right, good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Allison Gowen. Uh, I apologize for Microsoft Teams popping up. I didn't want messages to start popping up on the screen, so I tried to sign out and it, you know, still, it still didn't work for me. But um, anyway, so again, I'm going to talk about specialty crops and livestock and a little bit more information after that. Um, so starting with specialty crops, producers of specialty crops are eligible for CFAT payments for the following three categories. If a producer had crops that realized a 5% or greater reduction in sales price between mid-January and mid-April as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, producers who had produce shipped but subsequently spoiled due to loss of marketing channel and or producers that had shipments that did not leave the farm or mature crops that remained unharvested. Payments will be available for these eligible specialty crops for which a producer has production, not subject to an agreed upon price through a forward contract agreement or similar binding document. Payment details for eligible specialty crops are as follows. For those crops that had a 5% or greater price decline, payments will be for sales um, between January 15th and April 15th, 2020. Again, this is a self-certification. However, producers must maintain records such as a bill of sale documenting the price of the received crops. Payments for crop shipments that left the farm by April 15th, 2020 and spoiled due to no market are also uh, payments will be issued for those. Producers must obtain documentation such as a letter from the buyer explaining non-payment or other record validating non-payment. This applies to producers who have met contractual obligations in delivering the crop to the buyer, but have not been paid. And the third payments are for crop shipments that did not leave the farm by April 15th, 2020. For example, they were harvested but are sitting in crates on the farm or mature crops that were unharvested by that date. For example, they were plowed under due to a lack of buyers and which have not been or will not be sold. Producers also are encouraged to apply for assistance under CFAP if they donated crops that otherwise would have spoiled due to COVID related marketing disruptions. USGA will consider those losses similar to crops that were not sold or shipped from the farm. So the next few slides, I'm not gonna go over everything um, one by one, but these, the next few slides go over the crops that are eligible at this time. Some of the ones that I wanna uh, point out of course, they had to be mature by April 15th, 2020. I want to make that one very clear. If the crop could not be mature by April 15th, 2020, then it is not eligible for CFAP. So for here in Virginia, a lot that are on this list, either A, we don't grow, or B, they would not have matured by that time. But I do want to make a special note on this one. So for example, on this screen, we do have apples. Apples are eligible. So of course, our 2020 apples are not in and ready um, for market yet, but our 2019 apples may still be in cold storage. If our 20, and this so it is not limited to just apples, but I'm gonna use that as an example. So if we have 2019 apples that were in cold storage that were sold between that January 15th and April 15th, 2020 time period, they would be eligible under the first one. If they were delivered, but not paid, they would be deliver, um, eligible under that payment option too. And if they were in cold storage but could not be sold and therefore spoiled, um, they are in storage, then they would be eligible under option three. If any of those are any of these crops that are eligible, and I'll keep on going through the next slides to show the crops that are eligible. But if any crop as of April 15th still could be sold in a commercial market, they are not eligible for CFAP. So um, just going through those at the end, if we need to, to swing back around and look at those, we can. And in a few moments, I'm gonna talk about crops that you might not see listed on here. So I'm gonna go on to livestock now. So livestock eligible for CFAP include cattle, hogs, lambs, and yearlings. 
A single payment will be calculated using the sum of the producer's number of livestock sold between January 15th and April 15th, 2020, multiplied by the payment rate per head, and that's one payment. And then there is a second payment. They will be issued at the same time. The second part is the highest inventory number of livestock between April 16th and May 14th, 2020, multiplied by the payment rate per head. So again, it is, it will be issued all as one payment, but it is two payment calculations in there. Also still self-certification, producers do not need to provide any documentation at this time unless they are asked by the county committee to provide this documentation, um, but it is helpful to have that information available. But we need the total sales of eligible livestock by species and class between January 15th and April 15th of owned inventory as of January 15th, 2020, including any offspring from that inventory that was born in between those dates and um, sold. And again, between January 15th and April 15th, they had to have been sold between those dates. Then the second payment calculation will be for the highest inventory of eligible livestock by species and class between April 16th and May 14th, 2020. Livestock sold between January 15th and April 15th of 2020 that were hedged for future prices are also eligible for CFAP. Cattle that are any part of a dairy operation are ineligible for livestock payments unless the cattle have been converted to beef cattle. A table with common livestock terms is available on the farmers.gov website at www.farmers.gov forward slash CFAP forward slash livestock that crosswalks these terms to CFAP cattle categories. Now I'm gonna go on and talk about some additional commodities. Brent mentioned earlier the notice of funding availability, also called the NOFA, requested information from stakeholders and producers on other commodities by June 22nd, 2020. So that ended this past Monday. USDA did seek producer data on any commodity not currently eligible for CFAP, with specific emphasis on data for nursery and aquaculture products. So therefore additional commodities, if any, will be announced at a later date. It was mentioned the other day on a call, we do not have any of those that will be. We do know that some other commodities have gone um, to the secretary for consideration, but nothing has been determined as eligible yet. So just you know, keep an ear out for that and USDA will, will definitely be putting out information as other commodities do become available. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Emily to go over um, some eligibility information. Thank you, Allison. Okay, now that we've reviewed what products are eligible for CFAP, I'm gonna discuss some of the forms and documentations that are required for applicants. Form names and numbers are listed on this slide. The first one is the AD3114, which is the program application or the CFAP application that's generated through, through the payment calculator. And as a note, I'll point out that the CFAP payment calculator online is linked on this slide. To comply with eligibility requirements, payment limitation, including adjusted gross income provisions that are applicable to CFAP, additional forms are required to be completed and submitted as well. The form CCC902 is the farm operating plan for eligibility. That's not listed on this slide, but only parts of this form are required to gain basic information about the applicant. For entities, the CCC901 identifies members of the entity and their tax identification numbers, as well as citizenship status. The CCC941, reports the customer's average adjusted gross income for programs where income restrictions apply. CFAP is one of those. The adjusted gross income limitation is $900,000. The CCC 942 is not a required form, but it may be applicable if the certification reports income 
from farming, ranching, and forestry for those exceeding the AGI limitation. The AD 1026 ensures basic compliance with highly erodible land and wetland conservation provisions also applicable to CSAP. The AD 2047 provides basic, basic customer contact information and the SF3881 collects banking information to allow USDA to make the CSAP payments directly to the producer through direct deposit. So farmers who have already complete, who have already participated in some of our programs or in our CS programs in the past may have already registered their farm, have a farm number, and may have already completed a lot of these forms. But uh, if you have not participated before, a lot of this information will need to be collected from the applicant at the time of application. And just a note on the CFAT payment calculator, um, that does require Microsoft Excel to run the workbook. All right, next slide. So before a producer begins to enter information on the application form, FSA recommends that producers begin with the CFAP calculator. The calculator is helpful because it will transfer information directly onto the form and will help a producer in, input specific information to their operation in order to determine estimated payments and populate the applicable, applicable form. Where there are most, multiple producers for an operation, producers will report information on the form based on their share of the operation. Because payment is calculated differently for different groups of commodities, producers will need to assemble different information depending on their operation to successfully complete the, op the application. And this slide shows some examples of additional documentation that they may need, may need to collect before beginning the application process. Produ producers are only able to receive payment for production, sales, and or inventory that is not subject to price risk, meaning that there is no agreed upon price in the future through a forwarding contract agreement or other similar binding document. Any portion of a commodity that is subject to such a binding agreement is ineligible and cannot be included in the application and considered for payment. That portion must be subtracted. For certain commodities, they must meet the eligible intended use. For example, crops intended for grazing are not eligible. For example, because CFAT payments for dairy are based on milk production, producers should assemble information about milk production for their operation during the first, first quarter of 2020, January, February, and March. Dumped milk that does not appear on marketing statements is eligible to be counted. Okay, so just a quick note on farm numbers. Dan Mertz is gonna go into this in a little bit more detail, but the AD 1026 was a required form on the previous slide, so I'm gonna mention this. Um, producers do not need to be existing customers to participate in CFAP. However, producers may still reach out with questions because the AD 1026 form that certifies a producer's compliance with highly erodible land and wetland conservation rules instructs that certain producers need a farm number. The form describes producers who are waived from needing a farm number, but many producers will not meet those waiver specifications identified on the form. So producers who don't meet the waiver specifications identified on the form can still move forward with submitting the form without one. An FSA uh, will still accept the application and form AD 1026 and move forward with processing their CFAP application. If approved, they'll they'll issue the CFAT payment, but the local FSA office will follow up at a later date to establish a farm record with them in order to fulfill the form's requirements. Please note that producers participating in CFAP do still have to comply with highly erodible land and wetland conservation provisions as the 1026 states, and they agree to comply with those provisions when they sign the form. And a reminder to producers that it's important to keep copies of the documentation and records that are being submitted just in case uh, a yearly review is performed. So what do new customers have to do? Um, all of the information and application materials are available online, so they should certainly start there. Producers can also receive an application by mail and the call center is a great place to start for producers. And we're gonna go into a little bit more information about the call center in a moment. Uh, so the first few steps the uh, an applicant may want to take is to review CFAP information and eligibility guidelines. 
download the application or request the application by mail, call the hotline with questions to get more information about the program. Uh, producers can apply by mail, fax, hand delivery or drop off or electronically. But the application should be submitted at, to the local service center and an appointment should be made before you, you call, uh, before you go in. If producers need assistance with the application, they can make an appointment for that assistance as well. And as I said before, new producers don't need a farm number, but they will need all of the application forms uh, in order to uh, submit their application. And some of those are listed again here. So we mentioned that FSA has formed a customer call center. Uh, the staff at the call centers comprise of FSA field staff from around the country. Um, the number for the call center is listed on this slide and callers can work one on one with an employee and get um, answers to questions and um, as well they may forward the applicant directly to their local service center for more specific um, questions or, or um, information. The call center was established primarily to help producers who may have never done business with USDA before and have questions about the process even before they get started. But any customer applying for CFAP may call uh, if they have questions. The call center is the most direct and fastest way for producers to get information about and help with applying for CFAP. Call center employees are able to provide technical assistance when filling out the CFAP application, but as I mentioned, may direct a producer's local county office to follow up on eligibility questions that require a local office uh, determination. So this slide shows the order of events for a farmer. The applicant will access the application online or request an application by mail, schedule an appointment with the local office, Begin filling out the application using the call center for immediate assistance and starting with the payment calculator tool. They can submit the application so it can be reviewed. If you made an appointment, the producer can attend their appointment uh, to get tailored assistance with filling out the application if needed. And just a note, if you make an appointment and decide you don't need it, call back and let them know our service center uh, staff is very busy right now, and so if you're not going to be able to make your application, please let them know that. I mean, I'm sorry, make your appointment, let them know that. And uh, once the application is reviewed and approved or rejected, uh, 80% of the eligible payment will be processed to the producer. This slide provides a video tutorial on YouTube regarding the payment calculator that's available on the CFAT page of farmers.gov. It's linked here. The video helps producers by explaining a typical scenario for the process when someone is interested in applying, including eligibility, forms to fill out, documents needed from FSA, how to complete the application electronically without needing to make an appointment. If you're an existing customer, or even if you're not, now's the time to take into consideration completing forms electronically and sending to FSA using a computer if that's possible. It can help to streamline the process and uh, expedite the application processing time. If producers are unable to complete applications electronically due to inaccessibility of internet, FSA will work to ensure the producer receives the application and can complete by mail uh, with over the phone assistance. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan Mertz now to talk a little bit more about farm records. A Emily? Emily? Yes. I, I was going to try to convince everybody how easy the application process was for the CFAP program since we don't have to have a, a farm number, but then you intimidated me with all the forms that have to be filled out. I think it was your your first slide, which, which this, this program I think is a whole lot easier to sign up if you're a new customer if you're an existing customer you've you've been through the routine and what that means is all those forms th thank you emily um <laughs> what that means is all those uh forms that emily had pointed out will need to be completed and um for for other programs aside from 
the CFAT program, if um, you're not already an existing customer, we're going to have to do some work to update our farm records. As you see on this slide, you, you see some of the, the pieces of data that we keep in our farm records system. And, and um, again, my, my theme here today, I, I think I was included as a, as a courtesy by, by Brent. I, the, the farm record system has some applicability to this program, but of course it's, um, it's integral to, the, to, the, uh, to our, our farm program sections and the payments that, that we make because without good farm records, we sometimes don't end up making the right payments to the right people. And that's a pretty important aspect of, of what we do. Um, Allison, if you're running the slides, if you'll go to the next one. So we have a we have a pretty sophisticated um, system of farm records, and it's based on a modern um, customer relationship management software by um, SAP. And the, the 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 screen that you're looking at now, you, you see all those blocks on the right all contain pieces of information that are important to to the, to your farming operation or the farming operation of our of our customers there's lots of different data elements beneath each of those that I won't take time to to get into today Allison if you go on to the next one for me please up at the top you um, saw the GI what we call the assignment block the GIS assignment block in in our system we we have information about our producers and individuals and if it's a farming entity the the people that are associated with the entity and one of the things that we need to do is to locate your farming operation and to identify all the land associated with a farm we do that with our modern gis system we have drawn um, boundaries around each of the fields within a tract or a parcel of land and those um, fields get aggregated to the track level and then they're associated with that farm number that we don't necessarily need for the CPAP program but is uh, again integral to what we do at the farm service agency. We get new imagery, uh, aerial or satellite imagery if you will, about every two or three years and we use it to, to keep our records up to date and to make sure that we have all the cropland digitized or um, marked that that's available for farming in a county and also in the in the state. All this data that's part of the farm record system belongs to the producer. Legally, we're not able to share it with anybody but the producer and whoever the producer gives us permission to share it with. So if you work in the extension service and if you want to work with one of our producers and need data that's supplied by FSA, um, you get together with your producer and the producer will give us a written statement about what we share and how long we, we can share that and who we can give it to. Um, next slide. Most all of our programs require an annual report of acreage. Producers come in and tell us what they planted where and um, depending on the program all the crop land associated with the farm needs to be required it's um, again it, participating in a program other than CPAP which doesn't require an acreage report um, so, so this this information is required but it also could be a good practice for producers who don't necessarily um, get involved with FSA on a on a regular basis having the information in our farm record system makes participation in many of our programs that we don't know are coming like CPAP it just kind of creeped up on us if we have the information for you it is yours and it's um, available for um, documentation and, and use and it's a, a good practice. You, you know, as you go through life, uh, I, I don't know how it is for you, but my, my beard's dragging on the ground right now. I'm about at the end of my career and I've filed my stories by decade, 1960s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, and, and so on. And every one of those decades, I think I learned something a little 
different maybe a sentence or two that somebody um, told me that has guided me in my life. And in a previous career, one of my bosses asked me what he thought my job was. And after seven minutes of letting me twist in the wind and telling me that everything I told him was wrong, he told me that my job was to make him look good. And that was easy enough. And then when I came to work for FSA nearly 20 years ago, one of my first supervisors told me that farmers want to know two things. How much am I going to get and what do I need to do to get it? Well, a good system of farm records is going to get us to a point where you can participate in the programs and the payments that we have available to you. So having um, said all that, I'll thank you for the time today and wish you good luck in the future. Oh, by the way, we, we have 41 offices to, in Virginia to serve you. The little green dots are where our offices are located. Some of our offices serve one county, some serve multiple counties, but um, depending on where you are and where you live, you want to stop by and visit your local FSA service center at your earliest convenience. Brent, I guess we go back to you. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ashley and Allison, Emily and Dan for their participation today. One thing that we just received, uh, we have a new process that's been enhanced uh, to make it possible to complete a digital CFAP application. The limitation is producers will need to have an EOF identification account with FSA, and you can obtain that through your level two EOF through your county office, through your local FSA county office. With that, we're open for questions. I saw that there was one question on livestock, Allison. If you could take a look at that particular question and uh, provide us an answer, I would appreciate it. And anybody else has any questions, we're here for you. So please ask away. All right, thank you, Brent. And um, thank you, Mr. Clark, for your question. Um, uh, to, to let everyone know what Mr. Clark's question was, is in regard to livestock, does the actual sales price figure into this equation or is it just the number and type of head? It is just by head and it is divided into five different categories, which are feeder cattle less than 600 pounds, feeder cattle 600 pounds or more, but less than um, slaughter, cad slaughter cattle fed cattle as defined. And then we have slaughter cattle fed cattle, which are cattle with an average weight in excess of 1,200 pounds, which yield average carcass weights in excess of 800 pounds and are intended for slaughter. Slaughter cattle mature cattle are cold cattle raised or maintained for breeding purposes, but which were removed from inventory and are intended for slaughter. And then there's the fifth one, which is the catch-all, which is for all other cattle are commercially raised or maintained bovine animals not meeting the definition of another cate category of cattle in this rule, excluding beefalo, bison, and animals that are used for dairy production or intended for dairy production. And that includes all cattle that are associated with the dairy production, even if they're non-milk producing cattle. But if they're part of the dairy production, they are not eligible. Thank you, Allison. Mr. Clark, I hope that uh, provided the answer you were looking for. Um, we're open for more questions. Um, the microphone is open or you can do it by chat. We'll give you all a couple of minutes. Let us know what your questions are. This is Bob. Yeah. You, uh, you did answer my question very good. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, the way I, the way you explain that, though, I mean, it seems like to me that if anybody sold any livestock, any eligible like cattle, I forget about goats and sheep, but if they sold cattle during the window, then they probably are eligible for a payment. Yes, if any cattle were sold in between uh, January 15th and April 15th of 2020, they will be eligible in some regards. It had to be commercially sold, um, you know, as part of the commercial operation. Um, 
and also for any livestock that were born. So as long as the um, the cow was owned on January 15th, if she were pregnant and then had a calf during that window and that calf was sold, that calf would be eligible. So for the sold portion, they had to be owned on January 15th or born from a livestock that was owned on January 15th to be eligible for the sold portion of it. And then for the second part, which is highest inventory on hand, and that's between April 16th and May 14th of 2020, that livestock did not have to be owned on January 15th in order to be counted. So if they were purchased during that window or purchased after January 15th at, at any point, they can be included in that as long as they were on hand somewhere in that window of, of April 16th to May 14th. Thank you, Allison. Mr. Clark, did that answer your question? It did, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, appreciate your question. Hey y'all, this is John Bovet again. I just wanna take take another opportunity to thank you for, um, for participating and to the folks who've tuned in to listen. I appreciate you um, being here this afternoon and asking questions. We are going to be, uh, we are recording this webinar and we will be sending out um, a link to the recorded webinar. I'm not sure whether um, FSA is willing to share the slides without the recording. Um, but um, we can clear that up. I just wanted to ask quickly, I've been having a, a couple conversations with agents this week about goats, and I wonder why goats were not covered, are not a covered commodity, at least initially, under CFAP. So that kind of falls under to the part when I was referring to the NOFA, the Notice of Funding Availability. So in determining what was available going into this, um, that was what they were able to determine did ha what the price losses or marketing was impacted by COVID-19. So a lot of things, it's, it's a lack of market information. Uh, AMS, is, I'm going to go back to specialty crops because that's where a lot of that it will come from. AMS, um, Agricultural Marketing Services, they do track a lot of those things. NAS um, collects a lot of this data as well. So for USGA at large, we have a lot of data already kind of in-house, but we are also missing a lot of data from a lot of other areas, aquaculture. So in, in my guess, it would be that they just did not have the information for goats at the time. I, Brent, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do recall um, someone saying that goats were submitted from somebody um, to the NOFA. So it will be considered, if, if enough market information was given to show that there was a 5% a or greater national loss, then it will be considered and then maybe made available at a, in a future date. What Allison stated is absolutely correct. The, um, a goat producing group here in the state of Virginia has requested that goats be included and submitted a comment to, for that under the NOFA. So we're hoping that that will take place and they did provide the information that was necessary for it to be added. And I'm sure there's many other goat producers nationwide that feel the same way and probably would be adding, would like to see the goats added. Of course, sheep are eligible under the program to begin with, but the, the goats at this point are not. But we're hopeful that they will be at a later date. Great, thank you too so much for the clarification. Yes, sir. Uh, John, um, the, you know, the question on whether uh, we can provide the presentation, we can do so. Uh, we'll provide that to you, and then you can disseminate it to the uh, to the public as as do your outreach efforts. Great, thanks so much. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the meeting open for a few more minutes in case anybody's having trouble connecting and answering or asking a question. Um, but please jump in if you if you do have a question.
Uh, this is Bobby Clark again. I has a different question about the uh, HEL requirements. So, I mean, we have a lot of grassland in the valley, a lot of cattlemen, and a lot of that land is probably HEL land, but it's all in grass. And is that going to be the kind of thing that really slows down their ability to jump? Or how's that going to work? I'm kind of excluding all the cropland because it would make sense that that has to be determined. But I'm not sure what happens to all this grassland out there. Uh, Mr. Clark, as far as the grasslands, uh, grazed land goes, um, if it has not been cropped or will not be cropped, that's not a problem on your on your 1026 because it will continue to uh, have a cover will have a cover on it and it will not be cropped to an agricultural commodity. So at this point, that the grasslands would be fine um, if they decide if a producer decides to um, side bust, take that side and turn it, or plant corn in it or wheat or something of that sort. Um, they would need to get a conservation plan through NRCS um, and uh, follow that conservation system to ensure that they're not um, causing any undue erosion and fulfilling the, the requirements of the 85 Farm Bill through the 2018 Farm Bill. Does that help, Mr. Clark? It does. I, the way I'm reading what you said what is, you said is yeah. it's not doing anything with corn and everything's in grass they must check a box saying all my farm is in grass. And then there's just no, that's the end of the HEL determination, apparently. That would be correct, sir, yes. Yeah, and see most of our crop guys, not all of them, but a whole bunch of them participate in crop insurance. And I think HEL determination is all part of that in the first place, I think. Yes, sir, that would be correct, yes. They, uh, to qualify for crop insurance, they have to fulfill the 1026 requirements for both HEL and for highly erodible land and also for wetland conversions also. Okay. I'm just, I'm wrapping my head around how much of a barrier that would be for people. And uh, um, it doesn't, you know, with that particular explanation, I think that won't be a huge barrier then for, for a lot of people. Very good. Just a quick reminder that uh, the sign up ends on August the 28th. So if anyone is interested in signing up for the CFAP program, um, they do have until that point to, to enroll in the program, submit their application. Um, and also any of the other additional documentation necessary for the program. John, I don't see anything else on the chat. Um, any other questions that you may have or that you may want to discuss? I, I personally don't have any other questions. Um, so if, if anybody else from the audience has a question, please speak up. Otherwise we will just again, thank our speakers for their time this afternoon and um, I really appreciate it, and I'm, I'm sure everybody else has appreciated it too. John, if I could add just one more, two more comments real quick. Um, our ARC PLC program signup ends on Tuesday, June the 30th for 2020. Producers that are have not enrolled in the program that have base acres, uh, please make sure that you uh, contact your county office and submit your application timely. And also we do have a July 15th deadline for reporting acreage. And uh, that's right around the corner too. So uh, we do have the deadlines of uh, June 30th for ARC PLC and then July 15th 
for acreage reporting, and then August 28th for uh, the CFAP. So John, back to you. Well, yeah, I think that's it. So again, thank you all. Um, and I will be in touch when we have the recording available. Um, and I'll also send out the slides um, within the next day or so. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.